Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to begin with a discussion of uh, Orientalism. And then I want to spend a little bit of time, uh, very briefly, discuss, discussing the physical geography of India, because you'll need some sense of what we mean when we talk about, let's say, something called the Deccan. All right, and you know, what might have been the role of the Himalayas uh, uh, in shaping the Indian environment. You have to keep in mind, for example, that India is the only country that has an ocean named after it, right? The Indian Ocean. And so obviously, India being a peninsula is a significant, significant factor in the development of Indian history, all right? And then finally, towards the concluding part of my remarks today, I'm going to start discussing the Indus Valley Civilization. We'll continue that discussion just so that you know what we're going to do for the rest of the week. We're going to continue with that discussion on Friday. Uh, and then in the second half of Friday's uh, remarks, I'm going to start talking about the coming of the Aryans to India. All right. So let me begin with Orientalism. I've written the word over there, uh, obviously derived from the word Orient. It's opposite. Purported opposite in any case is something called the Occident, also known as the West. Okay, and the word Orient itself is actually a rather jumbled up word, if I may put it this way. Right? Because it can mean almost anything east of the Suez Canal. But it's included the Arab world quite often. And in fact, the key text that we're going to be reading, we're reading short excerpts from it. And that's what I'm going to discuss today is a book by Edward Said, the literary critic, who died in 2003. He was a professor at Columbia University and wrote what possibly is the most influential book in the humanities in the second half of the 20th century, possibly. Certainly one of the three or four most influential books in the second half of the 20th century, right? Uh, the word orient is also a verb. One orients oneself, right? Goes in a particular direction, okay? So now the question for us is, what is the Orient? And for our purposes, of course, we are, we are interested in India, and India would have been included in the Orient. Uh, the American usage of the Orient actually has referred largely to the Far East, to China, Japan, and Korea, principally China and Japan. Uh, but, there, but there have been American usages of the word Orient which have included India in it as well. Now, Edward Said proposed a certain thesis, which is called Orientalism, okay? That's not really the thesis as such, but because the word Orientalism refers to a number of different things. What he wants to make is an argument of the following sort. All right, and to keep this argument in mind, just go back to my concluding remarks on Monday. Remember where I started talking to you and I said that, just imagine that you had to think of 10 key words when you were thinking of Japan, and so somebody mentioned sushi, and I said maybe ramen, maybe kimono, okay, maybe Toyota, Honda, so forth and so on. Manga, manga might be one of them. You know, particularly if you go to Southeast Asia, I mean, it's uh, manga is Japanese comics, as you know, right? So there are these sort of signposts to something called Japan, and we want to probably avoid having such signposts because what these signposts do is they essentially reduce a complex civilization to certain key elements. And there may be a difficulty in doing that for every civilization, but, some, but for some civilizations this enterprise may be much more hazardous than it may be for others. Right? So in the case of Japan, we could say that probably it's a very hazardous enterprise to try to reduce all of Japan to 10 or 15 or 20 of these little signposts by which we try to understand this complex civilization. Okay. Now, in the case of India, the, these signposts would have included such things as, as I said, the Taj Mahal, snake charmers, right? If you're living in the diaspora, I mean, almost every South Asian, every Indian, certainly, they'll, they'll probably have some familiarity with something called a samosa or bhangra, right? These become the little signposts to something called India. And obviously what we have to try to do is try to understand what are the enormous problems in reducing civilizations to such signposts, and now let me use a little more complex word, essences. The study of India, right, so before we actually start looking at something called Indian history, we have to be worried about something else. 
And what we have to be worried about is how do we actually study another civilization? Right? Particularly if we're studying it from the standpoint of a civilization that is quite different. Right? And so the first proposition that Edward Said makes, so proposition, this particular proposition is not novel to him by any stretch of the imagination, but then we're going to see what he's going to do with it, is that there is a particular relationship between power and knowledge. This is the first proposition. There's a particular relationship between power and knowledge, and you're all familiar with this proposition in very casual ways. One of the casual ways in which you're familiar with it is you've heard the expression that history is written by the victors very often, most often. Right? That is that those who have the power shape the discourse okay, of a particular society, of a particular phenomenon. Right? And this need not be a power knowledge relationship that is simply confined to relationships between different cultures. There is a different, there is a similar relationship you could argue between men and women. I mean for every hundred books written by, by men, let's say, on the nature of women, okay, there's probably one such book written by a woman about men. Now that's beginning to change obviously with feminism, women's studies, so forth and so on. But there's been obviously an enormous inequity of representation. So now there's a second word that you have to think about. Representation. How do we represent another culture or civilization? Okay, and how do we do it without doing it enormous injustice? Who represents whom? With what right? With what authority? With what consequences? Okay, so there are two propositions you need to keep in mind. One, that there is a relationship between power and knowledge that generally we have to understand that bodies of knowledge are shaped under certain socio-economic material situations. And they're very often shaped by people who have the ability to shape that body of knowledge. Okay? And secondly, that when we're speaking of bodies of knowledge with relation to cultures or civilizations, then we have to say who represents whom. So if we look at the history of India, now we're going to find that Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, the bulk of Indian history was actually written by the Europeans. Right? Now this is where we come to Edward Said's particular contribution to this problem. Because of course some of you might say, well why should we assume that this is a problem in itself? Right? That if Europeans are writing the history of India, why should this be a problem? And would it be any better if Indians were to write their own history? And I can tell you the answer to the second question, no, it would not necessarily be any better, notwithstanding what Hindu nationalists might say, or what Indian nationalists might say. And might not be any better because many of these historians might in fact be replicating European models of knowledge in their work. Okay? And this is what Edward Said, in the conclusion of the book which you are not reading, referred to as what he called second order Orientalism. So let's say 70 years after independence, I mean India acquired independence in 1947, okay? So you know, 60, 70 years after independence, you might say that, well, you know, there's a large body of Indian historians who are working on India, and they are the primary authorities, well, not necessarily for the study of Indian history. And they may not be because they may still be replicating European models, European paradigms. So then we have to go back to the 18th century to understand what Said's own particular contribution is going to be to this problem, the study of this problem. That is, how does one represent another culture? What are the circumstances in which one does that? And what are some of the hazards of those kinds of representations? So now what Edward Said is going to say is the following, okay? In Orientalism, he's going to say, that it's not simply that there's a relationship between power and knowledge. We know there is a relationship between power and knowledge. What he's going to argue is this particular form of representation by which Europe represented the Orient. And for our purposes, India is what we're interested in. All the examples that he draws upon in Orientalism are largely drawn from the Middle East, also known as West Asia.
Okay? Most of the examples are drawn from there. I mean, there are some examples drawn from Africa, a few, some from India, but largely from the Middle East. So Edward Said is going to argue that in the 18th century, and the 18th century is not an innocent age for this, studying this question. Why is it not? Because by the 18th century, European co colonialism is to be encountered in its full form. Okay, so if you look at the history of India, we know that by the second half of the 18th century, Britain is going to become the dominant colonial power. Now we know that before Britain, Spain and Portugal had empires, and we know that in the 18th and 19th century, it's going to be not only Britain, but it's going to be France is going to be the other dominant colonial power. By the late 19th century, we're going to have countries such as Belgium, okay, coming into the stream here as well. Germany, not much left for it to acquire in the world. It'll take whatever it can get by the late 19th century. All right? This is a scenario you have to keep in mind. So we're not speaking about an age of innocence here. So what Saeed is now going to argue is that this form of representing the other became institutionalized in the late 18th century. Okay? This is the key point. Now let me be very clear about what I'm saying and why you should understand that. And I'm going to elaborate on this point. Edward Said is not saying merely that people often have prejudices about other people. We know, we know they do. In fact, I think if you encounter anyone who says they're completely free of prejudices, you should be very suspicious. Because prejudices may be tacit, they may be implicit. They're not always explicit. Okay? You know, people may have prejudices about others on account of race, language, religion, sex, sexual orientation, and so on and so forth. Okay? But Saeed is not simply saying that the Europeans had prejudices about Indians. I'm sure that Indians had prejudices about Europeans too. But there's a difference. The difference is that Europeans are not writing about the Europeans. Indians are not writing about Europeans. They are not representing the Europeans. And one reason they are unable to do so is because they don't have the power to do so. India is a subjugated country in the late 18th century, and certainly by the early 19th century, much of India is going to come under colonial rule. Okay? And this is true, of course, of the other colonies as well. So if somebody said, well, what's so special about the 18th century? Because there is a, something special about the 18th century with respect to Said's thesis about Orientalism. What he's really arguing is that what's special is that it's not simply that the Europeans had prejudices about the Indians or the Chinese or the Arabs. Right? I mean, if you read Herodotus, Herodotus is writing in the 5th century BC. Okay? It's full of prejudices. In fact, actually, some wonderful prejudices, which is why reading Herodotus is a huge amount of fun, frankly. Okay? Right? Okay? Full of prejudices. But is Herodotus an Orientalist? No. Not in Said's sense of the term. Because a systematic way of institutionalizing difference had not arisen in the 18th century. This systematic form of institutionalizing difference arose under conditions of colonialism. Okay, so Orientalism, therefore, is an entire intellectual and cultural apparatus for discussing, defining, evaluating, and interpreting the other. A civilization that is not your own. Okay, and the other interesting thing about this, which is very often not understood, even in many discussions of Orientalism, is that Said is saying that when Europeans start writing Indian history, they're writing Indian history not just for themselves. They're not saying that, so you know, for example, you have a historian called Elphinstone, and he writes this huge history of India. Okay? I could, and, you know, we'll, I could give you 20 examples of his, histories of that kind, written in the late 18th century or early 19th century, or Alexander Dow who's writing in the 1770s about oriental despotism, as he calls it. 
Now, these people are writing these histories not just for their own people. They're actually writing these histories for the Indians. Because the argument is, we know India better than Indians know their own history. We know them better than they know themselves. So we are going to represent India not just okay, for ourselves. We are going to represent India for the Indians. All right? This is, in essence, what Orientalism is about. So therefore, the reason why you should really be aware of this thesis and think of it constantly as we move along in the next eight, nine weeks until we come to the end of term is when we look at a work of history and we're looking at many secondary works. I mean, there may be some principal documents, principal sources that you might look at. You know, you might look at an inscription written at a temple in the fourth century BC, for example. And that's not what I'm referring to here. What I'm referring to is the work of interpretation of that inscription. Okay, that's a secondary source, right? So what I, what I produce or the histories that you're reading by Romila Thapar, these are secondary sources. So now the question is, what is the intellectual epistemological presumption with which a writer writes his or her work? Okay, is that work infused by a certain kind of Orientalism? That is the assumption that I am doing some work of representation, okay, which cannot be done by these people, number one. And this work of interpretation is now informed by certain presuppositions, and those presuppositions obviously arrive from conditions of hierarchy. Because in the 18th century, obviously, a hierarchy is established between the Europeans and the Indians, right? Or between the Europeans and the Arabs. There's a hierarchy that's going to be established. This hierarchy is going to be critical in shaping the nature of historical work. That's what Edward Said is saying. Now, the work has been heavily critiqued by many who say that, ah, well, Said is saying that it's impossible for a European to offer a fair assessment of Indian history or Indian civilization or the Arab world. It may be that that critique is fundamentally true or close to what Edward Said's position is. I think Said is saying, in effect, that it's actually very difficult under conditions of colonialism or neocolonialism now, under conditions of enormous inequity of power. Okay? And there is an enormous inequity of power even today between the West and the Arab world. There's just no question about it. Okay? I mean, the United States can contemplate thinking about, well, should we be bombing Iraq? Should we be bombing Afghanistan? Should we be bombing Iran? I mean, Iran doesn't have the luxury of thinking that way. So there is an enormous inequity of power. Let's not forget that. And we're saying there's a relationship between knowledge and the knowledge that is produced and the enormous inequity of power that exists. And that has existed since the 18th century. And as a consequence of this, since the 18th century, there has been an institutionalized form, okay, in which representation of the other, in this case, the representation of the East or the Orient has appeared. Now, I'll give you one illustration to make the argument very clear. Okay? And, I, and, and this illustration will reappear. All right? Will reappear when we come to the 18th century, when we come to that part of history from where I've drawn this particular illustration. In 1757, there's something called the Battle of Plassey. You'll hear about it because it's supposed to be the foundational moment of modern Indian history, right? The word battle is a misnomer, frankly, but we'll find out later on why that's not an appropriate characterization of what happened. The key point is simply this, that in 1757, this, at this so-called battle, Lord Clive, right, or Clive, let's not dignify him by calling him Lord, that's what he's known as, but Clive, okay, he is going to defeat an Indian Nawab. Nawab is a Muslim ruler in the state of Bengal, and this is going to become the foundation of British rule in India. Now, the justification for the British entering into this conflict was that some months preceding this, the Nawab, okay, and 
the Nawab of Bengal, his name is Sirajuddaula. You don't need to worry about the name right now. We'll get to him later. Okay? Some months preceding this incident, the Nawab had apparently, apparently, okay, confined several hundred Europeans as prisoners in one small room. That incident is called the Black Hole of Calcutta. The Black Hole of Calcutta. Google it or look up my site and you'll see some information on it. Now, what is the source for this particular incident? The source for this incident is one English man by the name of Howell who claims he was an eyewitness. Okay, and so I'm going to call Howell A. He is source A. Okay. Six months later, another man comes along. We're going to call him B. And he says that this incident took place. And he cites who? Howell. Because that's the only source. And of course, we don't know if Howell was actually there. That's what he claims. That he was there and he saw this. And he saw that when the door was opened in the morning, because several hundred people had been crammed into a very small room, they suffocated. And when the door opened next morning, they fell like flies. Okay? And this is going to become partly the justification for the attack by the British on the Nawab. Okay? And the battle. Now, a couple of years later, another bloke comes along. We're going to call him C. And C says, there are two sources for this incident, A plus B. And then a few months later, D comes along, another writer, all of them English, of course. And he says what? Now you should be able to guess what he's going to say, right? He says, there are actually three sources. Three sources. Well, there are not three sources. There's only one supposed source. And these sources are A plus B plus C. Right? And then you can go on ad infinitum. Right? So you can go to Z and it's going to be, there are 25 sources. Right? Now, this is one of the ways in which Orientalism works. Iteration. Iteration means repetition. Orientalism produces certain devices by which you interpret the other. In our own times, some of you may know this. You know, because already this happened about eight, ten years ago, what I'm referring to, but you might have read about it. Exactly the same phenomenon happened in the United States with respect to Iraq. <coughs> Weapons of mass destruction. Some bloke called Powell, the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, gives a presentation in the UN, says, ah, we've proven that they're weapons of mass destruction. And then, like a bunch of parrots, everybody else comes along in the administration, and they say, oh yeah, he said that, and then third person comes along and says, ah, po Colin Powell and X are saying that, and then, of course, the next day someone else comes along, so forth and so on. And we know that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Complete concoction. Okay? And that's been, demonstra that's been proven endlessly now, in the last few years, how this went about. This is one of the devices, okay? Because Orientalism, I'm explaining to you in the abstract. Now I'm giving you an illustration of how the work of interpretation takes place. So some historian comes along and says something, right? And then, you know, 10 other people repeat that. Well, that doesn't mean that it's true. And in fact, one of the ways in which discourse works, if you say something often enough, it might just become true, okay? And this is an argument that was made by somebody who was very influential in shaping the thought of Edward Said, a French philosopher by the name of Foucault, right? Who basically talks about what he calls truth effects. So that's going to be my last point for, for this portion of my observations about Orientalism. Foucault says that what discourse does, discourse is what we produce. It could be oral, it could be, but here we're looking at written discourse. What discourse does is produce not so much truth necessarily, but truth effects. Okay? So this is what Orientalism is going to produce. It's going to produce certain truth effects. And it will be for us to be extremely vigilant 
when we read colonial texts in particular, or even when we read modern Indian texts, because many of the modern Indian histories are based on colonial presuppositions, even when they think they are defying those presuppositions. Okay, this is what Orientalism is about. Does anybody have a question? It's a relatively complex matter in some ways, but I've tried to put it to you in, in what I think are terms of clarity. You know, does anybody have any questions about Orientalism? All right. Now, what I want to do is before I move into the Indus, uh, Indus Valley, is I want to just talk to you very briefly about the physical geography of India. Okay. Um, and before we do that, if you could turn your attention to these three words I've written over here, India. Okay, India is not the term by which Indians described their own country. See, we've already got a problem. I mean, we're studying the history of India and we're using a word that Indians never used themselves to describe their own land. If you go to Indian postage stamps, or Indian currency notes, right? Because those are the two reliable places you can go to for determining how a country defines itself. So now it uses two words. On every Indian postage stamp, you'll find two words. One is the word Bharat, okay? And this is in Devanagari script. You know, you'll find out later on what is a Devanagari script. It's a script in which Sanskrit is written, in which modern North Indian languages are written, such as Hindi, okay? Right? Uh, so you'll find the word Bharat and you'll find the word India. Because of course if they say Bharat, uh, when, the, you know, when this letter is going, and nowadays nobody's writing letters, it's all internet anyhow, but you know, nobody would really know what Bharat is. It would be a private conversation. So they use the word India, which is the word that has now been used of course for several, for several hundred years. There are other words by which this land mass was designated. Aryavarth. Aryavarth is the land of the Aryans. Okay, and there are going to be some real problems there because, of course, there are people who are not Aryans. And then the word Aryan is a form of mystification, frankly, by now. And particularly after Hitler and World War II and all of that, and the whole ideology of Aryan supremacy, there are real difficulties in using this word. Okay? But the designation by which Indians would have known their own country would have included the words Bharat, okay, Aryavarth, the land of the Aryans, and Hindu Stan. Stan means place, as in Baluchistan, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, same ending, right? Stan, place, right? So the place of the Hindus. And of course, there's a real problem now in this, using this word Hindustan today because we know that there's a significant percentage of the population of India which is not comprised of Hindus. There are Sikhs, there are Jains, there are Muslims, there are Buddhists, and there have been many other groups for a very long period of time. But of course you could argue that perhaps this word is partly justified on the grounds that perhaps, and this is what we're going to have to see, whether this is the case or not, that most of the principal contours of Indian history were shaped by those who would then later on become known as the Hindus. Okay? Or that in some way, this is a substratum of Indian culture. But we have to be extremely careful about that because we do not want to elide Hindus into India and India into Hindus and imagine that these are synonymous words, not even remotely. Right? So we are going to use the word India, which is now the accepted word, but I'm just beginning on that note to indicate to you that, well, when we st write, start writing the history of India, studying the history of India, we will encounter this problem at the very outset. Now, the physical geography of India, basically, so you've got a peninsula here, okay, and this is over here, Gujarat, and then, and this here is going to now be Bangladesh, right? Uh, you'll hear a bit more about that later on. And so this is, over here is what is called the Bay of Bengal. This is the Indian Ocean here, so this is all water, and this is the Arabian Sea. Okay, this is the Arabian Sea. Delhi is somewhere around here, roughly. Uh, Bombay, now known as Mumbai, okay, is over here on the west coast. And then if you've got, of course, many other major metropolises, we're not going to look at all of them for the moment. You have a huge mountain range over here. 
okay? And this mountain range is going to run for several thousand kilometers, the Himalayas, okay? The Himalayas. Uh, now, the Himalayan region has its own distinct culture, history, identity. And one of the things we cannot do in this class, I'm letting you know right now, is to look at the various cultures that together comprise this area. You know, uh, how, in what way is it a distinct region? Okay, what are the linguistic groups that flourish over there? And we are going to find that there are connections between different Himalayan groups, right? The, and that some of these connections certainly signify the difference between these Himalayan ethnic, linguistic, cultural groups and what you're going to find in the heartland. When people speak of the heartland in India, what they're really referring to is very often, uh, this is one of those prejudices. Now here the word prejudices is different than the word orientalism. Okay? They very often are referring to this portion over here, roughly, okay, and the river Ganges flows over here. Okay, it's called the Ganga in India. The anglicized form is Ganges. And this is where you're going to find the most fertile land. And you're going to find a large number of cities that this historically developed along this part. We're going to find that there is an earlier civilization before the civilization that develops along the Ganges. Okay, I'm going to come to that later on. But this is very often what is referred to as a heartland. Now, there are many other terms that are used um, for this area. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as a cow belt, for example, um, which is not to say that there are more cows there than there are in the rest of India, but, but uh, there is a politics around the cow and the protection of the cow, right? And this is something, again, that you won't understand right now, but it, you will understand it in due course of time when we get to the Aryans, all right? This portion in the south here, okay, and it's, it's not like you can draw a line like that, so, you know, but, but roughly, you know, somewhere... Th this portion over here, this is called the Deccan, okay, South India. And one of the things that distinguishes the Deccan from North India is that the four principal languages that you find in the Deccan belong to a different linguistic group than the languages spoken in North India. All right, now the geography is significant for the following reasons, and there are many others, but just one or two things that come to mind and that you should be aware of, is that the Himalayas introduced a barrier in some ways between India and the rest of the world. Which is not to say that this barrier could not be infiltrated because you've got foreigners coming in to India for a very long period of time, coming in from Central Asia, Turkey, West Asia, particularly Central Asia, and they're coming through what is called the Hindu Kush Mountains, okay, which is a portion of the Himalayas. All right? So they're coming there, but by and large we're saying that the Himalayan range, the huge Himalayan range, introduced a kind of barrier. Okay, and you know that, you know that when we speak about the Himalayan range, uh, we're speaking about, obviously, a huge number of peaks, uh, beginning with, obviously, Everest, which is, which is the tallest, but there are hundreds of peaks which are over 20,000 feet in height. Okay, so the lower foothills of the Himalayas means 10,000 feet or less. That's the lower foothills of the Himalayas. All right, that's what you have to bear in mind. Now, the other interesting thing, of course, is that India is a peninsula, and we are going to find that the Europeans are going to come not through the land, they're going to come by sea. That's going to introduce a new phase in Indian history. This, but one of the interesting things that we have to think about is what were the kind of linkages that India had with the rest of the world by sea. Okay? And this is when, now when we start to get into the Indus Valley Civilization, we're going to find that this is going to be exceedingly important. All right, so this is roughly what you should be thinking about. All right, now let me move into what is called the Indus Valley Civilization. Okay? And let me begin by saying that, you know, if you're looking at the Indus Valley Civilization, I mean, we are going roughly back to 3000 BC. There are obviously human settlements in India long before that. Okay? 
the Paleolithic age, as it's called, begins in India somewhere around 7000 BC, roughly around 7000 BC. The Paleolithic age here refers to the fact that they were using largely primitive stone tools, okay? as opposed to the Neolithic age, which we, where they're using more advanced tools. Okay? And you've got better stone implements and so on. Right? So, you, so we're not looking at this prehistory, which goes back 7000 BC and maybe even earlier, there's a place in Madhya Pradesh. Madhya Pradesh is a, uh, a state in central India, okay? where they have found cave paintings that date back to yeah, roughly 15,000 years, 15, 20,000 years. So we're not looking at the, his, the history of human settlements in India right from the outset. The reason we go to the Indus Valley Civilization is that this is the first period, A, for which we have sufficiently concrete evidence. I mean, this is all relative because it's still going to be very, very sketchy what we know about the Indus Valley Civilization, but we do know something about it. All right? Um, and secondly, you're going to find the development of cities. And that's crucial because there is a particular relationship between cities and civilization. All right? So this is why we go to something called the Indus Valley Civilization. Now the Indus Valley Civilization, so if you go back to this map, not a great map, obviously here, but just to give you some idea, is going to develop along the northwest part of India. Here, the northwest part of India, and there's a river here called the Indus. Okay, the river Indus, it has number of tributaries. One of its principal tributaries is a river called the Ravi. And for those of you who have some familiarity with, with India, today this land is the area that we call partly the Punjab, and then partly it's in Pakistan today. All right? So the Indus Valley Civilization develops along the Indus River. Okay? And as I said, it flows through over here, and it's going, it eventually empties out into the Bay of Bengal. The river empties out into the Bay of Bengal, and there are these tributaries, one of which is a Ravi, and this is important because we're going to find that there are two cities which are of supreme importance. Now, before I tell you a little bit about these two cities, which are actually quite identical, a few differences here and there, but very similar, these two cities. These cities, their Existence was largely unknown until the early part of the 20th century. In 1926, they started doing excavations. And before that, the general view was that the earliest Indian cities had developed along the Gangetic Plain. So remember I mentioned to you the river Ganga, also known as the Ganges, and that plain, the, that, that area is called the Gangetic Plain, named after the river Ganges. So the general idea was that the first Indian cities had developed along the Gangetic Plain, a city called Patna, and then a city which today is known as Banaras or Varanasi. Okay, it's got two different, two or three different names. It's got another name as well called Kashi, but but it's usually it's known as Banaras or Varanasi. Right? So the general impression used to be until these excavations were done in the 1920s, that the earliest Indian cities had developed along the Gangetic Plain, which is a very fertile area. And then in 1920s, our understanding of the Indian past began to change very significantly. Okay? With the discovery, in particular, of two cities, okay? one of them is called Harappa, and the other one is called Mohenjo-Daro. Now, let me, as a little footnote, say something here before I move to a substantive discussion of that. Both these sites are today in Pakistan. Okay? And that's not insignificant. It's not insignificant because if you read Pakistani histories, they'll tell you that the history of Pakistan goes back to 5,000 years. Now, there's something rather funny about that, if you think about it, because Pakistan is created in 1947. But of course, there are some sites which now 
are in Pakistan. These happen to be the oldest sites of the Indus Valley civilization. So therefore, the Pakistani claim is that Pakistan's history, in fact, is older than the history of India, although Pakistan is carved out of India in 1947. Right? And the reason I mention this is because for a moment, before we start discussing Indus Valley civilization, I want you to keep in mind the distinction between three things. A nation, a nation state, and a civilization. These three are quite different things. As a nation state, India has a history that goes back to 1947. That's when India becomes a nation state. Okay? And what is, by the way, the definition of a nation state? Does anybody want to venture a guess? How do, how, how do you define a nation state? Sorry? Constitution? Did I hear the word constitution? The room is so big that I can't always tell where, the, where it's coming from. Constitution, right? Um, okay, maybe constitution might be one, one way to think of it. Yeah, and what is a, yes? A sense of national identity. But, okay, so... Okay backed up by a certain kind of infrastructure, right? What does a nation state have the ability to do that, let's say, a nation may not have? In other words, let me ask you this. What is the distinction between a nation and a nation state? Can you think of a people who are a nation but are not a nation state? Yeah? Uh, a nation is a person just a people with a common identity. So Co okay. Okay, uh, so can you give me an illustration of, uh, of a nation that's not a nation state? Palestine. Palestine. Fine. That, that would be probably the first example that would come to mind for most people, right? Because the Palestinians have some kind of shared history, some kind of notion of a shared past. Um, there are all these mystifying things such as blood, you know, okay, which go into the constitution of what we call a nation. Um, one way to think about a nation state is a nation state is a nation with an army and a navy. Okay? Basically muscle power. Right? And then, and then we get into such things as constitution, the enforcement of borders, right? Passports, so forth and so on. Yes? Sovereignty, yeah. Yeah, Sover sovereignty, sovereignty would be another way to, to look at it. Okay? So if we're looking at, if we're looking at India, we're saying that Let's keep one thing in mind. Its history as a nation state is very, very recent, going back to 1947. Now, when the British come to India, they are quite convinced that there's no such thing as a nation called India. They're quite convinced of that. And this is going to be one of the grounds on which they are going to try to impose a certain rule. Because they're going to try to say that, well, there are all these people, they're called Bengalis and Gujaratis and Punjabis and Tamilians, right? And what makes them all gel together, right? And by the way, that's not quite the same as saying there are people who are from Florida and there are people from Massachusetts. Not at all. It's very different because you have to keep in mind that these people called Bengalis and Punjabis and Tamilians, okay? And so forth and so on, right? That all of these have very distinct linguistic identities as well. Many of the languages that we're speaking of here, because Gujarati is not only a group of people, it's also a language. A Bengali is a person, but Bengali is also a language. And many of these languages have histories that go back hundreds of years. They have distinct literary traditions that go back several hundred years. All right? So the British view is that there is no such thing as an Indian nation. And of course, there's no nation state. A nation state is a modern creation. And even in Europe, nation states are relatively new, relatively. I mean, you have to go back to the 17th century to something called the Treaty of Westphalia, which is going to inaugurate the nation state system. And then you have something called a civilization. Okay? 
And of course, India can be spoken of as a civilization. Right? And then we're going to have to see what are the various consequences of using this particular word. What are the ramifications of speaking of India as a civilization? Now in Pakistan, I said this is why I've been led to this, because this has become a very interesting site of contention. You see, the Hindu nationalists in India are extremely upset about the fact that the two most well-known sites of the Indus Valley civilization, which is the earliest civilization, frankly, of any consequence in India, now happen to be in a nation state called Pakistan. So who is going to claim the legacy of the Indus Valley civilization? This is where you get into the politics of history. Right? And we shouldn't assume, by the way, that you can divorce the politics of history from history itself. Okay? So this is why I'm mentioning this as a little footnote before we get into a description of what is the Indus Valley Civilization. Right? Now the Indus Valley Civilization began roughly around 3000 3, BCE, okay, before the Common Era, so about 5000 years ago. And there's, it has distinct phases which I'll get into later on. And there are some very interesting features of this civilization. One, it's an urban civilization. And it's exceedingly important to keep that in mind because throughout the colonial period, and this is where Orientalism comes in, the impression that was sought to be conveyed by the British was that India had always been a predominantly rural civilization. In fact, the Indus Valley civilization was a highly urban civilization. Its two major cities, Harappa and Mohenjo-daro both developed along the banks of rivers in an environment that is very dry and arid. Okay, that raises interesting questions. You know, why did, why did these civilizations develop along, these cities develop along these rivers in such a dry and arid environment? There is, by the way, a comparable example elsewhere in the world, which would be the Nile and the Tigris-Euphrates complex. You've got similarly dry, arid kind of environments, right? And civilization developing along the river. And there are lots of reasons. The river is, one, a source of fish, a source of food. Secondly, if they were trying to develop a civilization in the interior, it would probably have entailed the clearing of dense jungles. Now here they didn't really have to do much clearing. It's a dry arid environment. In order to do, by the way, clearing of dense jungles, you need a plow, which they didn't really have. Okay, so now we're beginning to see what are some of the features of this civilization. It develop, it's an urban civilization. And I haven't described the features of that. So what are the features of this urban civilization? What makes it urban? You've got cities, extremely good town planning, wide streets with subsidiary lanes, the streets meeting at right angles. In fact, some historians have argued, and I actually share that view, that the town planning that was displayed by Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, both these cities are in ruins, by the way, but you can tell quite a bit from the ruins that the town planning displayed by these cities is probably better than the town planning of most Indian cities even today. No exaggeration, certainly when it comes to sewage and disposal of sewage, because if you've been in India and have you been in many other parts of the world like India, you know that it's an absolute mess. When the monsoon rains come down, they have no idea what to do with it. Okay. Now Mohenjo-daro and Harappa had extremely good sewage from what we can tell sewage disposal from what we can tell from the structure of the cities. They use bricks. These bricks were produced on the fast wheel. All these bricks are of extremely regular size. So they're not irregular in size. Standard uniform size produced in a kiln. And the kiln is a, a few kilometers away from 
the city. Okay? Now, these are some of the features. We've run out of time. I'm going to obviously continue this discussion of the Indus Valley civilization. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus, A, on its urban features, its links with other parts of the world, and what we can say about some of the people there.